Hello and welcome to today's discussion where I will be talking about Tudor dress hooks. And this is an example of a dress hook. This is one that I bought back in, I think it was 2004, may have been 2005, at the Pensac War. And I bought this specifically because it has a Tudor rose right here. The only thing was when I bought it, I didn't actually know what this was. I was just so excited about an actual thing with the Tudor rose on it from the 16th century. So I bought it. And then I did my research to find out what the thing was that I bought. So let me share with you the information that I found. So here is an example of a dress hook. Um, this is at the British Museum. And one of the things I found when looking at dress hooks is that Every single one I found was made of silver gilt, except for there is one later that was made from white silver, but they're all made from silver. So that's the first thing to notice. This particular dress hook is English, and I have the length at the bottom. However, the museum did not provide the width for this particular dress hook. This specific dress hook is cast with three bosses set onto a heart-shaped back plate, applied with filigree ornament, and the back plate is scalloped around the edge. Here is another dress hook at the British Museum. This one is made of silver gilt. It is a trefoil shaped cusp back plate with three large bosses applied with filigree ornament. Originally, it had a pin securing a central element on the back plate. The bar for attachment on the reverse and the hook broken at the tip. It is also English, and I have the length, the weight, and the width at the bottom on the left-hand side. Here is another dress hook. This is with the Hampshire Cultural Trust, and again, it's made from silver gilt. It is uh, three hemispherical bosses, each with applied filigree ornament in the form of three circlets, with granulated knobs. The inner circlets have no knob, as in the center of the object there would have been a rosette, which is now missing. The object's fastening bar is also missing. This dress hook is English, and again, the length, the width, and the weight is at the bottom on the right side. Here is another dress hook. This one is at the Corinium Museum. It's made of silver gilt, and it originally was found in North Leach. The museum did not provide any information regarding the height or well, the length, the width, or the weight. Here is another dress hook, and this one I particularly like just because of all of the detail in the little flower. This hook is also at the British Museum. If you want more dress hooks to look at. The British Museum is one of the places to look at. This particular dress hook is the one that I was talking about that's made of white silver rather than silver gilt. It is in the form of a flower head. On the front, two layers of five petals in a circle, the innermost row punched and filed, the outermost row with projecting knobs alternating with five petals. A domed headed pin um, at the center holds the different layers of the fitting together and is riveted to the back plate. On the back is a recurving hook and a bar attachment. This particular hook was found in, I mispronounced this, I'm sorry, Wymond him? It's in Norfolk and the length, the weight, and the width is on the bottom right corner. So, so far I have been showing you actual dress hooks in museums, but what did they use the hooks for? Here are two examples of hooks actually being used. On the left-hand side, if you can see where I have the red oval, the dress hook is hooked to the, we'll call it the hem of the skirt. So imagine pulling the hem of your skirt up to your waist and then putting a hook in and then taking the cord around your waist and then hooking the other hook into the hem. And then this helps keep your skirt up off of the ground. So that way, if it's say muddy or just a dirty floor, this helps keep your skirt from getting dirty. On the right side is another example of a dress hook being used. This one is 
I believe this is a partlet and it's the back of it. Some partlets you will find are rectangle shaped in both the front and the back. Others, other partlets are rectangular in the front, but have a triangular shape in the back. And to help keep that triangular shape flat against the back, to help it keep a smooth form on the backside rather than say curling up or swishing around, a dress hook is put at the bottom corner of that triangle and then hooked to the jacket that the lady is wearing or the, the kirtle. And this particular one on the right side is from a painting from 1564. And I forgot to mention it, the drawing on the left-hand side is from Hans Holbein the Younger, and that one's from about 1532 to 1543. Here are a few more examples of dress hooks being used in history. On the left-hand side, this lady is a weeper. She is on the tomb of Sir Richard Knightley and Jane Skinner at the Church of St. Mary the Virgin. And this, I put as circa 1539, the tomb, Sir Richard died in 1538 and then Jane died in 1539, which is why I put it as circa 1539, since the weeper, this lady, along with three other ladies are on Jane's side of the tomb. So you have the husband wife on top and then the women weepers are on Jane's side and then the male weepers are on Rich Sir Richard's side. And if you look with this particular weeper, you will see she has the dress hooks holding not instead of the hem of her skirt, like like with this one, it was the hem of the skirt. This one, it looks like probably right about her knees would be where the skirt was pulled up from the knees up to the waist and then the dress hook hooked, wrapped around the waist with the cord and then the other hook holding the other part of the skirt up. This again, just helps keep your skirt up off the ground for whatever reason. If the, say you're walking outside and it's muddy, it's snowing out and you wanna keep your skirts from getting wet or raining, it helps keep your skirts up. And the other reason why I put this as circa 1539, if you notice this particular lady is wearing a gable hood, that's the, the house that looks like it's sitting on your head. And by the 1540s, that particular type of hood was growing out of fashion. On the right hand side, is another painting by Peter Bruegel, and he is Dutch. And this painting is part of a larger painting. It's called The Wedding Dance, and it's from about 1566. This, this particular painting is at the Detroit Institute of Art. And again, just like with this painting on the right side, you can see she has the triangular piece going down on her back, and at the very end is a dress hook hooking on to her dress. and more examples of dress hooks and paintings. On the left-hand side is another painting by Peter Bruegel, but the one thing to keep an eye on, you will find this one on the right side, if I go back, The Wedding Dance, that's by Peter Bruegel the Elder, and this one on the left-hand side is by Peter Bruegel the Younger. This painting is from about 1600, it's called The Wedding Dance in the Open Air, and it is part of a larger painting that is at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. And this particular painting is a bit darker in just the, the light shading, but you can still see where you have the triangle piece going down. And just based on the painting, even though you can't see a dress hook, I'm guessing a dress hook has to be there just because of how flat it is against her back. It makes sense that a dress hook would be there because if you look on the painting on the right-hand side, it's the same thing for the most part. The painting on the right-hand side is The Peasant Dance. It's by Peter Bruegel. However, the Kunsthistorisches Museum does not specify if it's the elder or the younger Peter Bruegel who painted this one. And again, this lady is part of a larger painting. It was painted in 1568, but I zoomed in specifically on her dress. Again, you can see the partlet around the top, going over the shoulders, and then going down the back on a triangle piece with the dress hook hooking onto the back of her kirtle. And if you want to see more dress hooks that actually existed in history, 
then I highly recommend checking out this website. I have the website at the end of this discussion. I'll have the website link for it. And it's by the Colchester Treasure Hunting and Metal Detecting. And if you just scroll down the page, you'll find examples upon examples upon examples of different hooks that were found. And they're even organized by early medieval period, post medieval period, 17th century. I think it's really neat to just explore and see all of the dress hooks that have been found. So these are just a few examples of what is on that website page. Silver gilt is pure silver, or probably more like sterling, that has been gilded with a process called fire gilding. So you would have your silver object, it's probably cast, um, and you'll work your less precious, precious metal, and then cover it in an amalgam of silver, or excuse me, gold and mercury. Um, in fact, that's where we get the term amalgam. We use that as a, a catch-all term for any combination of materials, but a true amalgam is a mixture of gold dissolved into mercury. And you create what was called um, butter of gold because it really looked like warm, spreadable butter. And that's exactly how you'd spread it on your base object. You could gild anything, um, but silver gilt was silver coated in butter of gold, uh, you put it on with a paintbrush, and then heat it over a fire to evaporate the mercury, and all you were left with was gold. Uh, this process was called fire gilding. Um, it is almost entirely abandoned now, except for rare cases of um, historical preservation or direct recreation of uh, um, I know the royal family uh, in the armories does still commission some fire gilt pieces, uh, but it's it's considered hideously dangerous now. Was it? It's a matter of perspective. If you were doing it outdoors in an area of good ventilation, certainly one wasn't going to harm you. But the gilt object would still contain traces of mercury, and that would come off during handling. Um, so a, uh, your, your silver gilt object was a silver object that looked like a gold object. We're going to be using brass. We'll be using brass. It'll, it will appear gold when it's polished. This is a piece of 10 gauge scrap. Um, we'll be able to make a pretty good historical approximation with brass. It was certainly a common period material. Um, cupric alloys in period were referred to as Latin, L-A-T-T-E-N, uh, Latin or Latin. Before the Renaissance, the science of creating alloys was not well understood, and there was an awful lot of, um, there were obscure techniques that were much more mainstream at the time. They would have had um, what we would now consider strange, very exotic alloying elements like arsenic uh, or lead to uh, alloys. And th what they were doing was preventing undesirable effects. They were allowing the resultant alloy to flow into a mold easier, or they were reducing bubbles, um, or they were making the alloy self-fluxing. Um, so what we think of as brass, the zinc-copper alloy, was um, rare. Um, also, what we think of as bronze, as a tin-copper alloy, was also surprisingly rare. Um, tin was used, yes, absolutely, but there would almost always be additional alloying elements like antimony and arsenic, um, uh, which makes a perfectly good bronze. Uh, arsenic bronze um, is uh, you use about 15% arsenic with copper. You'll wind up with a, uh, a very good bronze. It's a little brittle, but uh, for pots and such. Um, of course, the arsenic is trapped in the metal. It doesn't become uh, uh, poisonous in that state. 
but uh, so all cupric alloys were pretty much referred to as Latin uh, until the late Renaissance uh, when the science of metallurgy uh, progressed because of uh, developments of furnaces. Here we have an original example of a dress hook. This looks like some kind of copper alloy to me. It looks like it's brass. It's certainly not silver, but um, it's about an inch and a piece long. It's about, well, five-eighths of an inch wide. But the uh, collections of original examples indicate that about an inch and a half long is about as much as we want. About three-quarters of an inch wide, maybe an inch wide, is about as much as we want. So I have a piece of scrap brass here, and this is a top and bottom die that I made for an old project making a Roman singulum military belt. And it presses out holes or bumps kind of like this to give it a little bit of dimensionality. Smaller, of course. And so that's what we're going to do. We'll make a, uh, a button shape um, to be the center of our piece and then we will cut around it to give us uh, sewing loops and uh, the dress hook. So that's how we're going to start. I'm just going to roughly mark out where where to put my dies when it's under the press. That's close enough. It's not exact. It doesn't have to be. They're self-centering. If they're off a little bit they, uh, if they're off a lot, it'll just smash the metal. But if they're off a little bit, they'll push themselves into place. And we have a nice round bezel. So we'll do that again. So, we're oh. going to take these dies and make something just like this by pressing them together. So. Okay, I'm going to do that again. Because what happened was that the dies were a little bit misaligned and they actually tore the brass. That's not what we want, so we'll just hit it again. There we go. Much better. There's a lot of ways we could, could cut this. These are aviation snips. They cut reasonably well, but I'm actually going to cut them apart with a saw. Now, if we look at the existing artifact, we have remnants of what I think were fairly obviously sewing holes. So we're going to surround the bezel with, looks like, eight sewing holes. Um, so we'll just give ourselves a border, and we can use the impression of the die that we use to press our bezel as a guide. This will be the hook. It'll actually be quite a bit wider than that. So, there are holes here, 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 here. And 
out of here. And now we have to cut that out. All right, we've roughed out the shape. We need to trim it up a little bit, make it a little more, more even. You can see from the back, um, it's not pretty. I'm gonna make it pretty. Now we have our uh, mostly um, edge ground dress hook. But we need to thicken the hook because it's out of very thin stock. Even though 10 gauge is fairly thick as sheet metal goes, we want it to be a little thicker than that to match the historical examples. So we're gonna heat this up and we're going to beat it down. Okay, so after about a dozen repetitions, we turn this into this, and we're gonna do that again. Okay, after cleaning these up, the holes, are, uh, our marks for our holes just disappeared, so we're gonna remark those. And once again, at our cardinal points. and at the corners. Don't like that one. Better. Now I think we'll probably be making a kind of a rosette or flower shape out of this. once the holes are drilled. And we can rough that in with a grinder, but that really needs to be file work. So, probably something like that. And we'll do the same thing with this one.
I like that. There we go. A pair of 16th century dress hooks. If you have questions, here is my Works Cited page. And here is more on my Works Cited page. And one that I did add to this, if you look, you'll see Talbot's Fine Accessories. That is the merchant where I bought this particular dress hook from, if you'd like to check out the merchant's website. I hope you enjoyed this video watching my husband make me these wonderful dress hooks. If you have any questions, please post them in the comments below. Select thumbs up if you like the video, and as always, please subscribe.